Arnie Farron and the 1944 Utes are one of college basketball's most amazing stories. 71 years ago, they won the NCAA championship. Now with the war, it was hard to even field a team. Four walk-ons came from within about 40 miles and said they wanted to play. One was Ogden freshman Arnie Farron. I'd been all state every year in high school and I really don't believe Coach Peterson knew who I was. I knocked on his door and asked him if I could try out for the team. And as you get older, as I remember, he asked me if I had my own shoes. This walk-on team couldn't even play at the university. Troops were sleeping in the field house. Arnie and the team couldn't even practice here. In fact, every game was a road game, and they still won. Arnie Farron, that kid from Ogden, had his first of four All-American years. And then came the NCAA tournament. Utah was a last minute replacement. There was an all night train ride. And a week later, the team that had four freshman starters and only six players that saw action, that Utah team beat powerhouse Dartmouth 42 to 40. Arnie Farron was the most valuable player of the whole tournament. The team without a field house now had a trophy the NCAA trophy in a tournament they weren't even supposed to be part of a week earlier. Then the Red Cross saw a chance to really give war-torn America something to cheer about. They made a super championship game, the University of Utah versus NIT champs St. John's. Newsreels around the country flash the story. Little Utah, without even a home arena, was playing in Madison Square Garden. The amazing story did not end there. Those four freshmen from Utah played their hearts out. Most had never been to the East, and now they were in New York City. At the end of the game, they were victorious. The story that would show on movie screens all over the country. Well, of course, the return to Utah was triumphant. We had a parade. Uh, we had, I think, all the fire engines in the city. Uh, we prayed it downtown. They closed the school. Uh, we brought the parade up in, in the president's circle. So 71 years ago, this very place, a big parade was coming by, led by freshman most valuable player, Arnie Farron. Now that would be enough of a basketball story, but there's more. For the years at Utah caught the attention of the brand new NBA Pro Basketball League and the Minneapolis Lakers, which we now know as the Los Angeles Lakers, drafted Arnie. Arnie Farron, the kid from Ogden who had to bring his own shoes to try out for the Utah Utes, was now helping the Lakers show that folks would accept the new idea of pro basketball and making America's first pro basketball dynasty with national coverage and three championships. 1949, again the Lakers were tops. It was just like at Utah, only here it was Jim Pollard to the legendary George Mikan and to Arnie Farron for the layup. Thus, the Lakers won their third title. The team's terrific to be specific as basketball supreme. There's something about that Lakers Sixty-four years after his NBA career, and 15 years after my first on-camera visit with Arnie Farron, 90-year-old Arnie Farron's life is still surrounded by basketball's greatest tributes. And on top of them all is his memory of the 1944 Utes, the proudest moment of them all as he looks back today. If you like sports, that about is about as much fun as you can have. It was. Uh... An exciting thing to do. Ready was fun. The Utes of 71 years ago. Craigworth, good for Utah. This is the most valuable player. With Arnie Farron, you have to start with the numbers. These are mythic numbers you just couldn't make up. It's, it's an unusual distinction. A rare four-year All-America at Utah, he led the Utes to the 1944 NCAA championship and became the first of only three freshmen ever named tournament most valuable player. We were the only team in 1944 
that started four freshmen that ever won the NCAA championship, which I think is fun. Yeah. That year, Arnie's Utes actually went to New York to play in the National Invitation Tournament, but lost in the first round. The Utes were then asked to replace Arkansas in the NCAA Tournament after a car wreck injured two Razorback players. The Utes played and won, then got a second chance at the NIT winner in a special Red Cross benefit game. So we got to win the NCAA championship and then play the winner of the team that in the tournament that we had lost in, and, and we did beat them too, so we felt like that maybe that was pretty good. Finally of age, military service interrupted his college, but Arnie came back to Utah to play on the 1947 NIT championship team. He was again drafted, this time by the Lakers. The Lakers. We don't say Minneapolis in my house, we just say Lakers. <laughs> Arnie led the Lakers to a pair of NBA titles. Well, he did get a little help from a center named Mike. I told you, he and I led the league one year in scoring for roommates. We don't divide who made most of the points. Three tournaments, four titles, another rarity. As Tom Gola says that there are only two of us that have played on an NCAA championship team, an NIT championship team, and an NBA championship team. Arnie then traded his sneakers for golf spikes. And I could have won the state amateur championship twice, except I met better players. Yeah, well, there is that. <laughs> Arnie came back to basketball that, you know, as general manager of the Utah so Stars. Drafted Moses Malone. He became Utah athletic director, chaired the NCAA basketball tournament selection committee, where his youths were on the bubble. And Coach Archibald wasn't happy when Arnie couldn't get them into the tournament. But in an age when even the most revered sports heroes are tainted by scandal, the watchword of Arnie's career? Integrity. He is. He is Mr. Integrity. Bill Child has known Arnie for 40 years. Oh, I don't know of anyone that has a better life and a better resume and proven himself to be a model, to uh, be a real pioneer of progress. And I suspect part of the reason that I'm getting this award is that I had a 13-year-old great-grandmother who drove a wagon across the plains and it is pioneers in athletics. Those pioneer genes led to one of the most incredible sports careers in America. The pioneers brought that spirit of having athleticism and competition, and uh, so it really was uh, fun. In basketball, in business, or life, when things really matter, Arnie Farron can still make his shot. <laughs> the 100 greatest moments in Utah basketball history. Utes in the Big Apple. In 1947, the National Collegiate Basketball Champion was crowned in Madison Square Garden. We're in Madison Square Garden in New York City. In cooperation with the University of Utah, is mighty happy to bring you that exclusive play-by-play -play account of the finals in the 10th Invitational Basketball Tournament between the Utes of the University of Utah and the University of Kentucky. The highly favored Wildcats were number one seed in the NIT, the Utes the number eight seed, and had won their first game with Duquesne by only one point, their second with West Virginia by two, while Kentucky had breezed to the final game. But the Blitz kids from the West were the New York crowd favorite. Coach Vadel Peterson used only six players, Leon Watson, Fern Gardner, Watt Masaka, Arnie Farron, Fred Widener, and Lyman Clark. Down together, it's stolen away by Masaka. Here's Masaka on a quick break, dribbles down, but once he gets into Utah territory, he stops, holds it up, waits for Farron. Here's Farron's push shot in. While Farron and Big Vern shared offensive chores, it was the defensive play of Watt Masaka that captivated the crowd. Watt held Kentucky's leading scorer, Ralph Beard, to just one point as Utah won by four, 49 to 45. Vern Gardner, the MVP, and the Big Apple belonged to the Utes. Madison Square Garden, 1944, the NCAA championship game. Utah in the light jerseys versus Dartmouth. 89-year-old Arnie Farron remembers it like it was yesterday. It's surprising as you get my age, how many things you forget, but I don't forget this. And how could you? 
Arnie, number 22, with his 22 points, earned the MVP trophy. It has a bumper two in it. I have a bumper two in my head to match it. The Utes National Championship story 70 years ago is like a Hollywood script. The young Utes, most of them right out of high school, had just lost in the NIT. But after the tragic death of an Arkansas player in a car crash, things would change. A phone call came saying, would you come and take Arkansas's place in the NCAA tournament. They beat two teams to make it to the championship game against Dartmouth, which turned out to be a game that defined March Madness. This was the first overtime game in the March Madness history. Utah won 42 to 40 before a crowd of 15,000 people, then came home to a huge celebration. The Utes have not repeated an NCAA championship yet. The closest they came was Rick Majerus' 1998 team that lost to Kentucky in the title game. For Arnie Farron, that game in 1944 changed his life forever. His jersey retired in the rafters of the Huntsman Center. At home, his office is a time machine. Arnie still has the 1944 championship game program, a room stacked full of awards, and photos of his two NBA championships with the Minneapolis Lakers. So how does Arnie's 1944 team stack up to today's college basketball? The world we were in, we were a pretty good basketball team. With this stunning view of the Huntsman Center from his balcony, Arnie hopes one day his beloved Utes will make basketball history again. Halls of the University of Utah nearing its 100th anniversary year. Seems like an out-of-the-way spot to hunt was. Never mind those co-ed fellas, I'm not talking about them. We're strictly concerned with the world of sport. And this is Bill Stern taking you over to the gymnasium where the athletes hang out. Here's one of the finest, best-equipped buildings devoted to indoor sports in the entire nation. But let's not stand here staring at it. Rather, let's continue the search for our Cinderella's inside and... Here they are, Coach Battle Peterson's Utah Basketball Brigade. Hardly rated a chance even in their own Big Seven Conference, the Utes started quietly perfecting the fundamentals of the game. Peterson doesn't believe in wasting shots and spends plenty of time on shooting practice. With accent on the layup, he believes every man should lay up a few shots for a rainy day. team that's turned out to be one of the most colorful in the land. They have a number of nicknames. The Redskins, which is official, the Blitz Kids, the Cinderella Cagers, and from the Bobby Sox Brigade, Cute Utes. Looks like old rocking chairs got them, but it's just the Peterson system of practicing getting rid of that ball. Volley passing or tip tossing it's called. And you'll notice they stress accuracy rather than speed. The sitting position keeps them from putting body English behind the pass. Idea is to use fingertips, wrists and arms rather than weight. Comes next foul shooting. Here the Utes are at their best. Now let's meet these KG characters close up. Introducing Arnie Farron, highest scoring guard in collegiate ranks and playmaker deluxe of the Utah aggregation. All-American center, Vern Gardner, voted best all-around player at the National Invitational Tourney in New York. He's a dead shot with either hand tied behind him. Forward, Leon Watson, a ball hawk who's on top of every play. He throws few shots away. Leon's light, but a shifty swifty. Fred Widener, a real team player on both offense and defense. A guard who has to be guarded from any spot on the court. He's a hot shot. Watt Misaka, midget of the squad, one of the finest ball rustlers and floor players in the business. A Japanese-American, he served in the Pacific in Army intelligence, and that's the key to the kind of basketball he plays, intelligent. Lyman Clark, workhorse of the Utah squad who plays either guard or forward. A dangerous Dan, his specialty is the long high looper. They call him Lyman the Skyman. Dick Smoon, guard, a first-class play breaker-upper and a set shot artist who's known around the Rocky Mountain loop as Tricky Dick. Barron starting the play. Watch that deceptive backhand pass to Masaka. There it goes to Gardner, who just taps it over to Wiedner. Fred's pet is the one-hand set, a sort of shot put. Swish. The 
Newt started out the season like Cinderella, practically orphans. But where the gal in the fairy tale had a pumpkin for a co pumpkin around and make a pie out of it from any old position. Working it through the defense is the Ute Sport. Watch Farron set up this play with a backward overhead lob to Smoon, and the rest is regular routine. Swish. Outside the defense, it's Farron handling that ball. There's some of that backhanded business to Gardner. He gets rid of it quick to Clark. What makes this outfit click is not individual stars, but that old team play. Redskins get away to a slow start in the regular conference season. They just hadn't learned to pull together. Their timing wasn't quite perfect. Then the combination of Masaka now handling the ball to Leon Watson taking the pass, put out the Utah pair. It's one thing to be good on the practice floor, quite another to rack them up against major competition. And I don't mind telling you, the opponents on their schedule didn't worry much about the team that was rated just a shade better than fair to Midland. We've given their special stuff the once over lightly. Now let's see how it clicks when the Redskins and the Rockies go on the basketball warpath. the ball for our Cinderella's, the National Invitation Tournament in New York. The dark-shirted roaring Wildcats of the University of Kentucky are overwhelming favorites. Colorful Kentuckians carry the attack to the Utah goal. Ute strike right back, moving with precision and superb passing. There's one to Farron, and he doesn't waste that shot. Crowd in that Wildcat goal, playing a cool, well-paced game that pays off at the cashier's cage. <laughs> Looks bad for Kentucky. One of the few times in the season the Wildcats have trailed. There are no pushovers and stay right in there fighting, but they're missing shots. Gardner comes up with it, moves to the Kentucky defense zone. There's a perfect pass to Farron, and Arnie hooks it in. Something for Utah backers to howl about. With seconds to go and trailing by four points, Kentucky tries desperately to stay in the game, but it's all over. The Redskins are the nation's rage in the cage. Utah's great team and their coach, truly the Cinderella team of basketball.